I'm Ryan Milliken from Hardway Performance, and you're listening to the Diesel Power Podcast. This is Jaron Holder from Holder Down Performance. This is Anthony Rings from XDP. I'm Demetri Miller with No Zone Diesel. I'm Drew with DNJ Precision Machine. I'm Pinky. And you're listening to the Diesel Power Podcast. Diesel Power Podcast. Diesel Power Podcast. And you're listening to the Diesel Power Podcast. The one and only Diesel Power Podcast. Well, Chris, it's an honor to have you on the, the Diesel Power Podcast. Talk about trucks, uh, how you got into them, what you guys do over at AutoWorks. So we're we're honored and glad we could have you on the the show today. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, it's been some time for me uh, in this industry. Uh, it's uh, come amazingly around from what it started out as, and uh, I'm willing to give you what I got. So you know, shoot. <laughs> When uh, when did you get into diesels? When was the first time you thought, "Oh, I really like these things"? Well, it came down to I had I had myself a hot rod that I was uh, wrenching on, and I was doing some work on other ones. You know, they were five liter Mustangs. They were a dime a dozen back in the day, and uh, we got into um, forced induction superchargers. They were relatively cheap, somewhat easy to do, and you know, with the the relative simplicity of that system, they were quite easy to make some pretty good power with. And then you start having to add power and hard parts and, you know, fuel injectors, and it just becomes that same vicious circle. So the vicious circle kind of stirred up so much that I realized it was going to be time that I needed a vehicle to take said car from place to place instead of counting on it to be reliable enough. Because I went ahead and I uh, I violated the 80-20 rule of reliability, which I tend to still do this day. But, you know, I guess we never learn from our mistakes. We just keep on making them. That's what makes life that beautiful, vicious cycle that it is. <laughs> so when the car became no longer mine, it still was a great idea to get a truck. And uh, bottom line was somebody took it. Somebody stole it. it somebody wanted it more than me, obviously. And... Uh, it was time for me, I guess, to move on. It was time for a message from the Lord to say, okay, you know what? This is not what you want to be doing anymore. So uh, I still wanted the truck. And I said, well, it's time to get a truck. And I got myself a 97 Dodge. And uh, I didn't know a darn thing about how awesome I got of a vehicle as far as the availability to make crazy power with. Because... You know, back then it was kind of like, okay, you can make some good power with it. Like when my 03 took, you know, I took possession of it. It was it was not like it is now where things are readily available. You know, you actually had to work to make some good power out of them. And uh, I, uh, at that point in time, uh, I uh, met up with my friend Mike, Mike Moore. Uh, both of us are now with AutoWorks Diesel. And he was a diesel mechanic and I was working with the hot rod cars and we kind of started working together on a project for a mutual acquaintance and you know it, uh, my hands kind of worked the way he liked and he didn't get in my way when I worked and it seemed to be like you know I was his right hand he was my left and it just progressed and I moved on into focusing on completely into diesel I went through a bunch of uh certification and training, uh, took the Association of Diesel Specialists tests and uh, got certified. And then I started working and, you know, working is how you get from point A to point B. And here I am. <laughs> now, I know you guys have been in the industry for a really long time, much longer than I have. And I missed that time, say in the mid 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, where the availability of parts and the knowledge and the advancements were they're just different than from from my perspective than what they are now so like when you got your 97 you got your 03 and you wanted to make more power how did you start that process oh boy the 97 it was like okay we're going to put an exhaust on this and okay i could feel that and then, you know, a couple of weeks go by, and it's like, well, all right, uh, I think I want to put some gauges on it. I had gauges in the Mustang, so, you know, it was only 
it only made sense to do gauges, but, you know, I was watching a vacuum gauge and a boost gauge that only swung to 9 PSI in the Mustang. And here I'm putting a, a boost gauge in the truck that's suddenly seeing 25 pounds of boost. So after gauges came, working with uh, doing some pump modifications in order to make some more fuel, and then we had to play with timing. And that was a big discovery. I'd say if you could ask me what the biggest discovery of the late 90s was, it was actually doing dynamic injection timing on the 12-valve trucks. It was something that we perfected from time and time again, playing with, you know, my own truck and Mike's 92. And uh, then we started to, you know, look at other trucks because mine was timed horrifically from the factory. It was like at two degrees uh, before top dead center. I mean, it should have been 13 and a half before top dead center based on the Cummins CPL label on the side of the engine. So we brought it to where it was supposed to be, and then we found that if we moved it a little further, it got better. And then we played with some power, and just it, it became, you know, we brought the fueling to the limit of where we could go with the current turbocharger, and then we played with the exhaust housings, and we made, uh, you know, we made improvements there. And then came the discovery of the whole set HX40 turbocharger. And I know people's necks, the hairs on the back of their necks are going to stand up when they hear that that denomination of a turbocharger. But back then, it was the thing to have. You know, nobody was blowing them up yet. And for some reason, the first batch of them that we got a hold of, those things stuck around for years. It wasn't until... You know, you started installing them three, four years later that suddenly they were blowing up. And everybody's looking at like, oh, these turbochargers are failing. But my factory one stuck around for like, you know, 80,000 miles until I until I moved the truck on. So that was the, the 12 valve, you know. And then we started playing with some electric fuel systems. That's when I ran into Brad Exum for the first time. But uh, I got the 03 and... Uh, that was a whole different animal because suddenly we moved from having to actually do physical work to make power to plugging in a module to a couple of connections under the hood and picking up 60 to 80 to 100 horsepower. And like, whoa, this is a whole different animal. And I mean, you know, you had you had the interim engine, the ISB, and you still had to do some mechanical work to make that one really work. You know, you could add an edge power edge module into the the isb and it was good but when it came full circle to the common rail engine that's when you could really crank them up and i mean look in 03 you know when we say we're adding 60 80 horse to the engine then that was taking a turd of a truck and really moving it up in power to something that actually might even break the tires loose if you tried real hard (laughs) but things go ahead they they definitely changed um, even as far as in 03 through the five nines into the six sevens and then also you know with the with the Duramax and its common rail injection system and the power strokes and it, it it's kind of come full circle to where now they're just like you said there's these electronic boxes and these tunes where you can pick up 120 150 200 2, 250 horse 300 on some of the six fours yeah. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, the 03, uh, I mean, we were pretty satisfied when we were sitting there at, you know, 80 horse because it was like, okay, this feels great. But you got these Duramax guys. They'd already had a common rail for, you know, two years at this point. These guys are running like 12s in the quarter mile at some of these shows that we were attending. And I'm like, wow, this is this is what it's going to progress to. So I played with um I, I played with turbocharger uh turbocharger add ons on my O three for a while. Um actually it was ATS before Clint Cannon when it was advanced turbo systems came out with an exhaust manifold. And I took that exhaust manifold and put it on my O three in standard configuration, not the second gen swap style. And I got a turbocharger from Pierce Harry. 
Now, if you haven't heard of Pierce Harry, Pierce Harry is a legend in the business. He was in it before I was, and he got out of it a few years ago and went to go fishing up in Canada. But Pierce, Pierce did some awesome things with turbochargers and fuel injection pumps. and I mean, he kind of laid some of the groundwork for everything everybody does today. If you guys could all thank one person in the industry, it'd be Pierce Harry. And, I mean, you know, he was making stupid numbers of 800, 900 horsepower on a single charger back in the 12-valve days. And uh, if you still search around good enough on YouTube, you'll find one of his burnout videos when he worked for BD. So uh, I got a turbocharger from him. It was a, a standard HY that, like I had from day one on the truck, but he did some internal work to it, and it made a difference, and it felt great. And then the converter started getting sloppy. Then the vicious circle started to begin. And I mean, you know, we're still baby steps compared to where we are today because even then, it was like, well, there's dehardened shafts, but nothing built yet. So I said to Joe Webb from Suncoast Converters, uh, God rest his soul, I asked him what uh, what I should do, and he said, well, I'm going to send you a converter and a valve body, and he goes, you're not going to drag race this thing and be at the track every day from morning till night, are you? And I said, nah, you know, uh, for me, it's more of a family wagon that just needs to go fast from traffic light to traffic light. And he goes, well, I don't think you're going to have a problem with the input shaft. So uh, in went a converter and a valve body, and we moved on. And yes, now we had a transmission that could do some serious difference compared to what it was equipped with from the factory. And remember, the 48RE was a pretty new transmission. It was a variant of the 47, but they made some improvements. It was better out of the box. And then it got real sloppy as, you know, as I put 10, 20,000 on it. So uh, then I moved on to uh, the, the, the PDR Pierce Turbo, got replaced by a Turbonetics ball bearing unit which was done by Diesel Dynamics, and it was pretty insane for a single charger. It was good. I mean, it was good until, you know, it got tired. But this is back in the day. We were evolving. We're, we, it wasn't like today where there was dedicated race parts every day. So uh, we moved on, and, of course, I, at this point, got a fast fuel system because the same guy I was meeting at the truck shows ended up starting up fast fuel systems. So I got a fast fuel system, a very early uh, heavy-duty system, which was the big red systems, and uh, put that in my truck, and that really made the truck sing. And we hadn't even touched injectors yet. That's That was still very new territory. But then things progressed when companies like Smarty came around, and we were actually taking the tuner out from under the hood and putting in this invisible line of code that would change everything about how we did business. And then uh, that's going to move us on to where we are now, where we're, you know, making crazy numbers with multiple turbochargers. And, oh, yes, I finally did blow up that transmission for anybody who's interested. I broke the input shaft, and I broke it in an awesome manner. It was Christmas week. One of my customers just got his new 6.7 Cummins. I mean, it was the very first 6.7 Cummins I'd ever seen. It was in uh, 2007, and uh, he goes ripping up the highway, and I went to chase him, and I'm like, ah, enough of that. It's not going to downshift on its own. I'm going to make it downshift. And I dropped that sucker into second gear manually, and when it upshifted into third and then fourth and locked up, it shattered the input shaft, and it was done. It was done. Couldn't even get the converter off the uh, transmission. It must have mushroomed the shaft inside when it broke, and that was it. So that had been after Joe Webb had passed on. And I called over to Suncoast, and I ordered up a trans. And I said, what's available? Billet, because billet was a big word now. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> we went with, you know, every billet shaft we can get. And uh, the only thing that wasn't available at the time was an intermediate shaft. That came later. Uh, we put a trans in it, and then it, that was at that was at eighty, almost eighty thousand miles. So I made it that far on the factory input shaft, driving it, you know, 
as best as I could. And at that point, it was already Smarty time. So, you know, we were already starting to make now pretty good power with a Smarty. And enough of power that we could mess up a transmission coupled with, you know, turbocharger and lockup devices. Because, you know, we were, we were moving into that spot where we were forcing lockup earlier and we were holding lockup for exhaust braking on the, uh, on the, the, you know, retarding horsepower side. And, you know, eventually it put enough of stress on that factory uh, input shaft hub that it broke the hub. And the input shaft itself, you know, got messed up along the way too and jammed in the converter. Hey, Suncoast got a, con- a converter stuck on a trans that they managed to get apart, but I wasn't about to take it apart myself. I tried and tried. So in went the new trans, and then we opened up the floodgates of power. Uh, probably about a year and a half later, I went with compound turbos, and then I went with uh, bigger injector nozzles, and then I went with bigger injectors and nozzles from industrial injection yet. I went with the R2s. And then we did some head work, and uh, the ARP 625s came around, and they, they went in, and uh, we started playing with um, opening up the air intake side of the cylinder head, and we went with a company called Wilson Manifolds. Uh, they did some pretty impressive stuff with a bolt-on manifold, and I got rid of the heater grid, but I mean, you know, that was a small sacrifice for making power and opening up the floodgates of that transition where you go from, you know, almost naturally aspirated until the thing really starts to make boost. How fast you could transition into actually building boost was important. And, you know, with compounds, it was even more important. And then I went into doing camshafts and uh, so on and so forth until we're sitting where we are. And then Smarty came out with the SSR tuner and the uh, the SSR really allowed us to play with fuel mapping. And I mean, you know, everybody looks at like the ability to call up uh, these awesome guys like, you know, Ryan Milliken and uh, EFI Live and just get a tune. But when SSR came out, we were all like, okay, here's the starting point. And we would play with a number and take it for a ride and play with a number and take it for a ride. And this went on for, on my truck, months. Months until I got it right. And when I thought I had it right, I didn't have it right. Because then I played around with numbers that Marco from Smarty gave me when we did a uh, training session with him. And then I worked backwards off of those numbers and found that, my goodness, what a difference I made in going in this direction versus that. And, uh, you know, here we are. We finally got it on a dyno. And it put down 753 and like 1,552 foot-pounds of torque. So it was pretty hot. And later that year, I took it out on a very cold Friday evening to the last day of the year for Island Dragway. And on street tires, I managed to squeeze out an 11.9 at just under 100 miles an hour because I was just skidding all over the top end of the track. And, uh, okay, I'm happy with it. I I accomplished what I wanted to with my own truck because you got to remember there are children that still ride in my truck, yeah. but um, my customers have uh, pushed me to do a whole lot more with theirs, and uh, you know we're still progressing. I mean, there's not a day that I don't learn something going to work, and well, that's, that's the day if if that day comes that you don't learn something, that's the day you should consider that maybe you've reached your potential and that's where it's going to end. But uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't ever want to grow up and I don't ever want to reach that potential. So that's definitely something that the, the newer crowd, which I would consider myself part of that, that we don't know all the work and the trial and error and everything that went into getting it to this point. We just kind of, you know, we look at a site or a magazine or, whatever it might be and we think it's always been like this but there was a lot of a lot of effort and and time and innovation that went into getting it to the point is you know it's at now and as you know as we look at the newer crop of trucks and, and I know you know from bi- from visiting your shop and being there and seeing all the different kinds of makes and models that are there is it does it changes every day you know, there's there's new tunes, there's new innovations, there's new things, and 
one of the things that a lot of our our fans and listeners have asked us is are there are there common things that you, that you guys see in the shop that they can do to prevent a catastrophic failure to you know as you talked about with the input shaft or or with the turbos things they can do so they don't have those catastrophic failures and make their trucks last longer oh yeah absolutely and i mean i i got a couple of things that just popped into my head like you know i i'm sitting here and i got the devil on one shoulder and an angel on the other and they're both whispering <laughs> things in my ear and you know uh that devil he's got uh he's got long tube headers on and he's got some horsepower and i'll tell you what you know the the balance between common sense and badness is what makes a really really good engine and some of the things that i see going on that cause problems are um you know uh Joe Smith buys part number XXX from, you know, diesel.com and puts it in his vehicle and he's going through the screens where it asks you, you know, all the little yes, no questions like, you know, smarty, what power level do you want to go to? Pick pick a lever, zero to nine. Nine! And uh, <laughs> we're timing one through four. Four, just bury it all right across the board. You know, and that's kind of like... Uh, that mindset with the younger generation, especially, you know, there's not everybody out there is a guy who's 60 years old who buys a dually that wants to haul his truck with a fifth wheel trailer around the country. Some of us buy these trucks to work and we want to keep them reliable. Some of us buy a truck because there's money enough to buy a truck and there's a seat where my butt would fit and uh, I want to do something to it. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like when they do that thing where they just, you know, just go right for number nine across the board. It's kind of like trying to build a house on the sand without putting a foundation in. And that's where I'm getting to with, you know, what's going to happen is like, okay, you're going to put the power all the way up. So you got a few things that are kind of okay when they're, you know, the way they are. And you've got like, okay, you got transmission. So. Most transmissions today don't take a whole lot of abuse over stock. It didn't take too long for the uh, 68 RFEs and some help from, you know, some of the uh, leading industry tuners in the uh, Dodge Cummins market to start to do enough in tuning that the 68 RFE became uh, sort of a redheaded stepchild of the transmission industry because you can only give it so much. It's a double overdrive transmission. I mean, there's guys putting some pretty good amount of power through them, but they don't last all that long in the end when you're really doing stupidness. And, uh, you know, and I'm talking when you're at compounds and 100 horse injectors or more and custom tunes and, uh, you know, and all the partridges in the pear trees that, you know, your favorite little songs end in. And uh, it, it eventually gets to the point where, okay, you're going to make that kind of power. And not everybody does, but when you do, then it's time to introduce a different transmission to the vehicle. Um, another thing that every truck needs is a fuel system. Um, I'm going to do another plug out there for fast fuel because I have yet to see somebody make something as well-engineered as fast fuel systems. Every truck needs one. The Duramaxes just need them the most, but every truck needs one. Uh, every truck benefits from them. Uh, I've had customers with fast systems that were put on early in their lives, and especially the Duramax guys, well, those are the guys that like made it through a hundred and some odd thousand miles with never having an injector failure. And, you know, and the Cummins guys, the same thing, you know, they're, they're the guys that are legging out those injector lifespan. A couple of guys that are hitting 300, 350,000 miles on factory injectors. And when you're talking about an 03 Dodge, that's before the days of stainless steel injector bodies. So, you know, they tended to fail a heck of a lot more than the engines that were built after 2004 and a half when they finally implemented stainless steel injector bodies from the factory you know nowadays you get new injectors on a truck like mine you know you making sure that they're going to be the new style injectors but um 
you know, back then it was like we were putting fast fuel systems on because it was a lot easier to service them. You could get a little more power out of the trucks. And when I say a little, back then a little was what you got because you were dealing with not great numbers, man. Like, you know, no triple digit numbers with just doing any one modification. Like nowadays you can get triple digit numbers putting a tuner in. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's another thing. Uh, is fuel system. Um, turbocharger is the third thing that came to mind. And bottom line is, you know, when you start pushing the max power that you can get out of a vehicle, you know the factory turbos, they're designed to move air and do it as efficiently as they can at factory flow rate. But once you start to crank up the power, you crank up the drive pressures, it puts uh, high EGTs against the head gaskets, and you get head gasket failures, turbocharger failures, uh, you name it, failures, uh, torch pistons. It, it just ke- it becomes the endless cycle because you're you're getting to the point where you're running a lot of fuel against you know not a whole lot of air anymore, and uh, that's when badness ensues. I like to use that word a lot. Badness ensues. Badness always ensues at the worst possible moment too. You know, oh, yeah. For me, it was Christmas week when a transmission let go. It, it happens, you know, and uh, it comes to the point where I am going to accept what was just handed to me because I deserved it. Because I looked at all the ways you should be doing things, and I said, I am going to bet my life that it's not going to happen this time. And, you know, hey, it happened finally. <laughs> Took 80,000 miles to do so or so. I forget, 70, 80,000, but it was a considerable amount, you know. There was a lot of full throttle there. And uh, when it did happen, you know, my next thing to do after decide about repair was take responsibility. That's the other R in the, the equation. You know, there's repair and there's responsibility because, let's face it, I made my problem. And I'm going to darn well take care of it. It wasn't somebody else's problem to fix, you know. I, it was me. That, my right foot was on that throttle every single time. So uh, in doing so, uh, you know, transmissions, turbochargers, fuel systems all build a healthy package. Not everybody could do it all at once. What's the smart way to do it? It depends on what you want to get out of it first, you know. Do you want to keep your transmission healthy? Then if you want to keep the trans healthy, it's an older style truck like a 47, 48. Uh, Pressures need to be evaluated. Governor pressures, uh, you know, line pressure. you got to look at your fluid. Has it ever been serviced? Does it smell like burnt rubber bands? Do you think those 200 horse injectors are really going to keep that trans alive in the end? Um and then fuel system too. You know, you can't you can't push what you can't send from the tank to the engine. So it's uh it's a vicious cycle, but it's a good cycle because done right, you can do stuff that just makes people you know, go out of their mind crazy with wow, did that truck just do that? It's how heavy? And that's the things that I got when I ran my truck uh back and forth. And I mean we've doing this we've been running trucks since ninety seven. You know, we had our race truck from Auto Works Diesel um, in 98, and this will put it in perspective. We were doing no crazy turbochargers because they weren't available, so we were running an HX40. We brought three to the track every day and three intercoolers because it happened. Let's face it. It happened. They blew up. We were pushing Mondo fuel out of that thing, and that was before we started running nitrous, and yes, we ran nitrous. And uh, we were running in the 11-second bracket. A couple times we actually got down low 11s, like 11.09, 11.20. You know, it was – and the, the mile an hour was like 105, 109. And it was gear-bound mile an hour at that point. But we were pushing some pretty amazing power to get into the 11s, you know, and running through the traps, you know, literally – 4,500 RPM and, you know, locked up in fourth gear. And uh, we made some pretty awesome things happen. We also welded a few uh, transmission internals together from 
the actual racing, not from not from welding, from heat of racing where we we had transmissions literally like internally weld clutches together and plates together and stuff where you know badness happened. Hey, that was part of the game. The race truck was awesome, but the race truck quickly got replaced by you know tuners that you could install and pick up the kind of horsepower that it took us, you know, three weekends at the track to get right by actually tuning the injection pump. So, uh, but it was cool while we did it. I'll tell you, you know, we were, we were running those kind of numbers a long time ago. And there's some people out there when we say 1998, I mean, at this point in time, it's like, there's going to be people that were listening to this that were either yet to be born or not even old enough to understand what a car and a truck are. Yeah. at that point in time but that was you know that was that was the infancy of the industry and it was pretty awesome to see when it happened because it didn't happen every day we'd be at the track amongst muscle cars and we'd bring out this big smoky truck that came out and just blew the crowd away to the point where everybody's jaw was still on the ground when we came back through the staging lanes again so, would have been a great time. Would have been a great time <laughs> to see, you know, right when it was starting and it starting to pick up. It's, you know, uh, it was it was a different time because at the same time, Patrick, it was it was a a quieter time in the world. Like you know, we all talk fast because we have no time because there's a million things to get done every day. I remember actually getting out of a day's work at AutoWorks Diesel and then putting six, seven hours in thrashing on the race truck and getting somewhere. I mean, now at the end of the day, if I could put in three, four, five, six, whatever hours, it's like that time flies by and it feels like you got nothing done because life moved on and got busy. But back then, man, when the world was a quieter place and the internet wasn't as big as it is, things, uh, things moved on pretty well on their own. You know, with when you put the the blood, sweat, and tears behind them. Most definitely, yeah. There was a there's a story I always tell because I you know, I've always well I've lived most of my life on the west coast or or west of the Mississippi, and you know, two or three years ago I got to go out to uh, New York, New Jersey, and that's when I got to see your guys shop for the first time, okay. and. Besides being in a beautiful area with amazing food that I'm still jealous I can't get unless I go out there, um, I was thoroughly impressed with the shop. And, and I've seen a lot of them, but the meticulous detail, the organization, the cleanliness that I saw everyone there have when they worked on trucks blew me away. And I thought people who live in New Jersey, in New York, Eastern Pennsylvania, really anywhere, need to bring their truck to this shop. And I wanted to ask you a bit more about what you guys offer people that, that are near you or want to drive to you. For Ford, Power Stroke, Cummins, you know, any of them, what does AutoWorks offer customers? Well, what I like to say to the customers, especially guys who uh, come to me, and they'll they'll come to me with their truck for – you know, you, you, you'll get like a whole bunch of people that will come in and do maybe one thing. And then out of those bunch of people, like, you know, another 3% of them will do two things. And out of those people, another 3% will do, you know, a, a few things. And then you get the bunch of people that go nuts. But it's the people that don't really know what we do that when we say, oh, yeah, we do that. Really? You do? So what I like to say to them all is we do everything from the headlights to the taillights and everything in between because the diesel truck is that different than the pickup truck that everybody else works on. And we like to keep it to us because the more hands that get involved in doing even simple little things like an oil change. I mean, look at an oil change on a six liter. You put the wrong oil filter in that, some you know unapproved aftermarket oil filter, and suddenly because the engine oil is used as a medium to make fuel injection work, you've got a, uh, an engine oil filter that either allows crud to get into the high-pressure oiling system or pieces of oil filter to get in. You know, it becomes this uh, this snowball effect that, you know, now you got a guy who can't get his truck to run right. So we offer 
everything from the simple things like oil changes to complex things like doing a uh, a swap of a 47RE or a, a 4R100 into a 67 Cummins that's reached the exponential horsepower limit of what the transmission can handle even in the most radical stage four ATS transmission. And uh, actually today I uh, was in touch with ATS to order up a 4R100 conversion for uh, for a truck that you actually helped me make happen back in the day when you were with ATS. And uh, you helped me push uh, that truck into doing a 68 RFE when that was the, what it needed. And we reached the limits of what that trans can handle. So we're moving on. And uh, we went so far as to do a 47 RE in a 2012 for one of our customers. And we made it down to the backup camera working where, you know, all the creature comforts that we like to talk about that may be put on the side for putting the transmission that you need in the truck. We brought all the creature comforts back into that. So we've gone to the point where, I mean, you, you've seen how we work. You've seen the attention to detail. Um, we get to the point where we actually do some groundbreaking work. Like the customer that brought us a 6.7 in 07, you know, and said, I want this to be like my 5.9. And nobody was doing any kind of, you know, race competition work back then, but we figured it out. We figured it out before the days of sims and programmers. We did it the old school way, where you start looking at what each sensor is doing and figuring it out and kind of just working backwards through the system. And uh, it takes great people to dig that deep into a system. And I wouldn't be where I am without Mike and without Billy and without uh, the two Steves that we had working for us and uh, without, uh, you know, we got another guy, Garrett, he's with us. And, you know, without the great people, I can only be as good as I can be. But together as a team, we can make a lot of good happen. And we can bring a lot of great out of what would be a, a normally mundane job. And even to the point where we do things our own way when we do an install. I mean, you know, we take a, we take a, a an install guide and we plus it. And we find something that, well, this this is great and this could be perfect down the road, but what if it isn't? What if, you know, what if this wire chafes on something? You know, something as mundane as that prevents a problem in the future. And I think that's what you kind of saw us doing while, while I was sort of putting a six liter back together while you were, you know, basically summing up what my whole shop is doing and, you know, talking to people on the phone. And it's it's as important to talk to the people on the phone and tell them what's going on with their vehicles or tell them about us because we don't advertise. What we do is we, we're on Facebook. We're, uh, you know, we're on people's Internet forums that mentioned in the customer's phrases of, you know, speaking their, their good about us as a shop, but we don't have a TV ad. We don't advertise on any forums as a paid advertiser. You know, we go by word of mouth and Facebook and some social media beyond that. But uh, we do a lot in that little three-bay shop. Uh, <laughs> summer In the summer, it's more like a 10-bay shop because we have a few parking spaces outside. But uh, when it gets cold out, we're confined to three bays. So... Yeah, we uh, we do whatever you like, including, you know, doing custom tuning. We offer tuning from any of the major tuners that are out there. And uh, electronics, you name it. I mean, I don't think that I've ever seen anybody uh, tackle a simple electronics installation like I watch myself or Billy do because we do it just a little differently. And there's you know, the attention to detail, just using wire loom and soldering and shrink wrap over uh, over all the solder joints. All the all the stuff that everybody takes for granted when it works, you know, that, that makes it be that reliable. And uh, it comes down to cleanliness on top of it all because, I mean, if you're searching for an hour to find something that's laying in a pile of junk, you're not going to be efficient. So cleanliness is huge too, and I mean you could 
You could eat off our floor on our dirtiest day. And I would on agree. Our cleanest, <laughs> on our cleanest day, it's sparkling. So, uh, you know, it comes down to it, – it's basically like the way a diesel engine works. The more efficient you make it, the better it is. And it's just the way our shop is. So There's two things that always stood out to me, you know, when I was – when you drove me to LaGuardia and I was, you know, had a three or four hour flight back to Colorado, but two things that there were a lot of things that jumped out and I, I remembered, but two was when you guys were done working on a truck, you couldn't tell it had been worked on. And that's always stuck out. It, 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 it's just, it's so important to me because a lot of times, you know, you can, if I work on my truck or something, there's going to be fingerprints on the fender. There's going to be, you know, grease on the valve cover, you know, just different things, but I did. I looked at all those trucks, and you could not tell any work had been done. And that, that to me, is one of the biggest signs of quality, caring, and attention to detail. The other thing was when we went to the, the show um, in southern New Jersey, I remember you guys had customers that drove there on their own accord and talked about the parts and talked about the shop because they believed and appreciated you guys so much. And that was that was inspiring to see that kind of customer loyalty. As as an observer who had never been out there or you know, had never seen your shop or, or been to that part of the country, it always stuck with me. Oh yeah. It's uh it's something that you know, when you're when you're in a place and you realize how good you have it, <clears throat> I don't take it for granted because it's something that, you know, I put my heart and soul into to make it happen, and I develop relationships with the customers. I like to think that all of our customers are an extended family of, of our own, and uh, they appreciate, and I mean, you've seen the people that, that were there standing in the sun all day, sweating, talking about their trucks to per, other prospective customers. Like you said, it's uh, it's something, and what gets them to that point is that 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 attention that that I'm gonna wipe your chrome grill after I do an oil change on it, just so there's not a smudge there where I may have leaked or a drop of sweat came off or you know any little thing. Um, we make sure that we go over that kind of detail, even in a six liter where you got the cab off and you put it down, and you know there's. There's locations of factory wiring, and then there's aftermarket stuff and things that we may not have done to the truck that some, you know, a stereo shop did or whatever. I go to the point of taking pictures of anything that is not normal and from the factory on a vehicle, and when I put it back together, it's put back where it was unless I find a better place for it to go, and uh, then I do it my own way, and... It gets to the point where, like, on, even on the six liters, when you're dropping the bodies back down, there's there's a couple of washers on some of the body bolts that we make sure we line them up so there's not even a, a, a mark of, wow, this was taken apart. You know, it's not even a shadow of where that washer should have sat if it was misplaced. So uh, it's all those little things add up to making something be the experience that you better be getting when you're paying for it. Absolutely. That's the people are lucky out there. <laughs> Don't them for years. If you're anywhere near there, it's worth the drive. <laughs> so what are you guys working on uh, for 2016? What are, what are the plans with, uh, with auto works and, and uh, you know, with yourself and, and your truck? Well, we're always looking to expand. Um, I keep telling myself, this is going to be the year that I do something radical with my truck. But um, my truck isn't what my priority is. I mean, it's nice when I have time to do some groundbreaking work on it, but it seems to be nowadays that, you know, I'm too busy doing everybody else's vehicle to make the kind of power or reliability or the ultimate tow vehicle that they need. And my plans always get put on the back burner, and hey, it happens. I mean, I'm not sour over it. I I love to work on my own vehicle. I love to have an extremely incredible truck, and it's it's due for something. I think its next mod is going to probably be a uh, industrial injection race head. 
with a ZZ Fab site entry intake because I did one on the, the truck that just ordered a 4R100 conversion trans today. And it, uh, that thing was pretty impressive with that setup. <laughs> and, uh, that truck's gonna get the 4R100. Um, we're gonna be doing an industrial injection street slash competition engine in a 2010 Dodge. I believe it's a 10. It's a fourth gen truck. Um, we're gonna be, uh, Working back and forth with industrial injection on possibly another coming six seven build for a uh, street slash tow vehicle in a fifty five hundred Dodge Mason dump, um, and then we've got a a ton of other work that we're going to be doing. Uh, just in you know the kind of stuff that people bring me a vehicle and say, okay, I have this vehicle, this this Ford. We'll just put a Ford out there, for instance. There's a lot more of them than there's anything else out there. So let's just mention Ford and say, I want this to be the best it could be to haul scrap iron seven days a week. So, you know, we we try to go above and beyond to make that happen and make his visits to us be only oil changes. I got a couple of six, seven power stroke guys that, you know, put some serious miles, and I'm talking like 1,500 miles a week serious miles. And I see them every two, three weeks for an oil change. And, uh, you know, it's it's nice to see them for the oil change. And it's nice to see their faces when they smile and say, it's the way it should have been from the day it was built. And, uh, you know, here we are, you know, some 150,000 miles since it was new, and it's nice to nice to get that, that feeling. And when he does have a problem, it's also nice to be there for him so that, you know, he could be back on the road doing what he needs to do with his truck. You know, it's uh, it's a big thing. You know, we realize that we wouldn't be there if it weren't for him, and he wouldn't be at our shop if we weren't there. So, you know, it's a, it, it goes both ways, but it's it's a really good thing having that, that feeling for doing that 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 thing on top of the the crazy trucks the crazy trucks are good they come and they go you know but uh the other uh the other guy uh with the the 47 transmission that we swapped in the 2012 truck he's been uh kind of juggling around the idea of doing the industrial injection race head as well and moving up to a larger injector at that point because it's going to be it's going to be the the most wicked dually that exists on the east coast and uh it's it really is a beautiful truck i mean you've seen it it's black it's gorgeous it's oh yeah squats yeah, down. Love- yeah you you know which one <laughs> it squats down real nice you know and boy does it move but uh the- there's he, he reached the point where he knows the only work it'll do is going back and forth to work so he can <laughs> use something else to actually do the work but hey it happens when you hit you know four digits of horsepower it happens so uh that's that's uh about what i've got uh in my near future and i mean you blink your eyes it's going to be summer i mean we're looking at the cold weather right now saying man you know it's cold it's winter it's going to be summer before you know it. and then after that it'll be christmas again and that's about the way it goes when you're busy you don't have much time to pick up and look around and say wow the trees are changing because you're making it happen every day, you know. Some sometimes more than five days a week, but uh, <laughs> it's something I wouldn't trade for anything, you know. Oh well, we, uh we're planning on heading out there probably end of, towards the end of the summer, maybe fall. Uh, definitely want to stop by and see you guys, and hopefully check out that that dually because I would like yeah. to see oh, it and, yeah. and just and take in the area and you know just stop by and say hi. So it's. Something we're definitely looking forward to, and it's going to be here, like you said, before we know it. Yeah, it it, it it's the I don't know. I guess it's it's just life, you know. Life moves on, and boy, when life moves on, it moves on quickly. Mm-hmm. You know, you remember being a kid in school waiting for Christmas to come. It felt like it took forever. Yep. And uh, now you blink your eyes, and it's like, okay, ooh, wow, it's summer. Oh boy, it's Christmas now. Oh, well, it's back <laughs> to summer again. And. <laughs> You know, I guess that happens as time marches on in life and you get busy. 
But, uh, boy, I can't wait for you to be around, too, because if you think you saw what you saw in a few days with us last time, oh, I got things to show you. <laughs> oh, I'm I planning on going for you. longer than a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, you're... You know, uh, the way to a man's heart is through his stomach, and brother, we got stuff in Jersey that just will blow your mind further than it was blown the last time. Oh, and, gosh. Uh, I still, I still dream about that food. Never had food like that. No, yeah. and it, it's, and, and you only got a slice of it. You know, it's, it's like, it's like that visit was just the appetizers. And yeah, we, uh, you we know, can't wait. The, the camaraderie too that you get. I mean, you saw, you saw the customers. You saw the crowd that hangs out um, after the show. You know the the friends, the extended friends, the friends of customers. It's uh, it, it's it's really amazing that there are a lot of people that hear New York area and everybody hears like, oh wow, those the, those rude people. But let me tell you something. I I've met great people in this area so much that I don't listen to the rumors of what these New York people are really all about. But, you know, I've met great people everywhere. I, I came out to Colorado. I had an awesome time. I, I spent, you know, nights in Clint's house personally, you know, how could you say that, you know, great people don't exist when you got, you got people opening themselves up, you know, to their own houses for you. And, it's that stuff in this industry that makes it really happen. You know, it makes the world go round. And, you know, there's, you know, on the same token, there's there's bad in, in the same thing. But we try to not focus on that. We look at all the good because, you know, good overpowers uh, overpowers the bad anyway. You know, like just like a broken truck, it can be fixed. So, you know, positive... Positive thoughts bring more positive thoughts. Negativity just festers more negativity. And, uh, brother, man, this is going to be a great year. Felt it from the minute the year transitioned. So, uh, you know, and uh, things things in the industry are, are changing, too. I mean, I watched uh, some videos of uh, Milliken doing some work with a two-step on his truck. And... Uh, you know, he's going to do some pretty awesome things this year. So, you know, overall, those of us who stagnate choose to stagnate. But we can we can all learn something from work and from life every day. And that's the greatest thing in the world is knowing you're still alive. Absolutely. We we appreciate uh, you taking the time to to chat with us today and, uh, I said before and say it again, the hospitality that you and Mike showed me when I was there and uh, to circle back around real quick is, you know, we, there's a perception that, that people from New York, New Jersey, that they're rude and, 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 and not hospitable. But I, I found the complete opposite to be true. I don't think I've ever felt more at home than when I was there and meeting people and them coming up to shake my hand or talk to me or, you know, give me suggestions on where to go eat. And I felt very at home there. And, uh, you know, as it ties into the industry, that's that's something very important as well is you can't judge a book by its cover. And sometimes you'll be – the best surprises are, are the ones you didn't expect. And in doing this podcast and getting to meet different people and hear their stories, I've learned a lot. I know our listeners have, and we look forward to, to keep – you know, bringing these these stories and these messages and these experiences to inspire people. That's what we want to do. And, and and like I said, Chris, we appreciate you chatting with us, telling your story, telling us how things worked back in the uh, back in the old days of diesel performance. <laughs> yeah, the Stone Ages. I hope I'm not dating myself with that. But, uh, yeah, you know, it, it had to come from somewhere. So you know. It's just like just like when you go to school and you learn math and you start to get into complex math. The first thing they teach you is where it came from, and then they teach you the easy way to do it. So it's kind of like how this industry works. You know, it's it's good to learn where it all came from. Mm -hmm. It's good to remember the people, and there were great people along the way when we were going through those those early days. And you know, we'd be at a track somewhere in Indiana and have a breakage, and suddenly you got all these people handing your wrenches. 
and you know great people great people like peter from south bend clutch great people like the hazleys people that we didn't know just a hand with a wrench kind of trying to help it happen so we can get out there and make one more run and uh that's what i really enjoy about this industry is that there's so much of that and just like with you when uh when i first started talking to you on the phone you know you were a phone call away when something needed to be taken care of or gotten in a hurry and there you are still on the other end of the phone i definitely appreciate it chris and consider you guys friends and can't wait to see you guys and and see the shop again and there's some more there's some more Sopranos scenes that were shot in that area that I feel a calling to go see because I love that show. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, awesome, Chris. Like I said, we we definitely appreciate it, and it was our honor to have you on. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate that greatly. <laughs>